Good crowd. All right. So we didn't read 26, 1 and 2. So real quick, y'all close this chapter 26, which is the Torah this week, by saying, do not make idols for yourselves and do not set up a carved image or a pillar for yourselves and do not place a stone image in your land to bow down to it. For I am Yair Elohim. Guard my Shabbatot and reverence my set-apart place. I am Yah. Selah. So let's go ahead back to chapter 25 of Bihar. And again, keep in mind, this is about redemption. This is about land. This is about order. What other principles can you all notice from these readings that stood out to you? What principles stood out to you in reading this? Any? Um, Maury, I was um, just kind of, what came to my mind was um, that there are more seasons than, you know, just the ones that have been obvious to us that we have missed or just didn't know about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, interesting over in Israel, there's pretty much two seasons. You have a wet, in a dry season. There mm -hmm. are other countries in which that is also present as well. Other countries in which that's present. But um I mean it could be definitely. So when you say that though, Yuma, what are you what are you referring to? Well let well, me get clarity uh, first. Maybe I'm referring to the uh sabbatical year and um mm -hmm. um the, the year of Jubilee as a season and maybe they're not a season but I'm just saying that mm. They are times that that we never knew that they should be observed. We never okay. understood that. Now, I think someone was saying that the Amish uh -huh. farm in that manner, um, rotating their fields with the set, uh, seventh year. Right, and that's 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 a science too. That's what a lot of people don't understand. It really is. Mm -hmm. In that. When you're dealing with agronomy and, and, and agriculture, there are scientific methods that have been proven to yield optimal crops, you know, optimal yields, you know, um, and this just correlates to our spiritual reality. It's the same principles. That's why I asked, what principles do you all see in this that we can extract, that we can reap from this reading? And most impl importantly, you know, digest, metabolize, and apply to our life. So when you're talking about those cycles of sevens for, let's just take the Amish, for instance. When people do this, it yields the intended result, which is more quality and probably more quantity. So excellent point, Ima. Any other thoughts? So how does this continue from last week? What is what is the connecting point between Imor and Bahar? The two parsha, last week's parsha and this week's parsha. What what joins and connects them? Well, it seems like um, last week we went over the holy days. Okay. So um, we went over the feast mm -hmm. and um, and showing us the, you know, like on the 10th day of the seventh month, that's the day of atonement. And right. the seventh day is the Sabbath. And um, it just shows these times that are being just should be um, should be observed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Showing the different Sabbaths like you went through. There went through you the go. Sabbath. So the connecting point between Imor, Parsha Imor, which means to say, Parsha Bihar in the mountain, is the Shabbat or the Shabbatot, or the Shabbatot, the Sabbath days 
of Yah. And just real quick, how many did we discover last week there are? How many commanded days of rest do we have from Yah? Remember, it's like 70 something. Um, right, 72 days. 72. 72 days out of 365, Yah commands us to be still, to enjoy his presence, to focus on his word, to fellowship and draw closer with those who are of Yah's fold. Imagine the result of that. What, what type of synergy? What type of outcome does that create? What does that create? I would say a unity. Exactly. It creates the oneness that Yah is desirous of us having, that humanity desires to have. And the secret of the oneness is just trusting in the word of Yah and following. That's all it comes down to. Because then your fruit will be produced right. Right? You'll have the right thoughts. You have the right seeds with your words. And this all aligns into the bigger picture of Yah being one. That's what that prayer is all about. Shema Israel, Yah Eloheinu, Yah Echad, Echad, one. Complex unity. Everything is united in one in Yah, including Yah's people. And so Yah is giving us the formula here in Bihar with how to go about sowing life and reaping life. And it takes time. Just look at this. Verse 3, six years you sow your field. Six years you prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. In the seventh year of the land is to serve a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to Yah. Do not sow your field and do not prune your vineyard. But this is all reflective of what? What is this seven-year sabbatical year reflective of? A great harvest? Which, yeah, yeah, you can say that. That's a part of it. Well, it just, to me, isn't it showing creation also? Order, yes. But on a seven-year cycle now, we've had the seven-day cycle. Mm -hmm. But this is just what we were, I was reading this article today. This is a fractal of that seven, right? Right. Mm -hmm. you go from se every seventh day, now you got seven years. Years. Right? And then you got, you know, 49 years plus one. Those are all fractals that are expanding Multiple, out mm -hmm. at a more than seven. <laughs> exactly. These, these, are, these are observances. These are occurrences that expand the full scope of what this purpose is for. Can, and we can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. How, I, I mean, um, how do we actually, um, is this a, our observance, is this just supposed to be spiritually? Because how do, I, I mean, if it goes down to land, would that not be the land that y'all have given to us and that's mm -hmm. not here and right. um, how do you um, you know how do you do one part and you can't do the other you might can let your land rest give the land mm -hmm. that you buy right here but suppose you have a, a even a mortgage um, mm -hmm. uh, you can't tell the mortgage company I'm not paying you for it yet 
uh, how it, it, are these observances supposed to be the spiritual observance or how is this done? In faithfulness, you know, to y'all's words. So this is where, again, this is about a communal reality. Our problem is, one of the problems I propose we face is we are siloed. You know, we try to do things independently. We try to do things individually. We try to do things with and by ourselves for ourselves. And so once all that ego is given up and you're able to bring this together, it's kind of like that one. You fade in a way, Moray. I was saying once we are able to set aside our ego and our pride and we're able to get into that oneness that occult Nicola was talking about, then you'll start to see this manifest. This is when this stuff manifests and, and, and it's a matter of really. You gone again. Wow. I would say it's a matter of really just submitting ourselves to Yah's will. You know, I think of Romans 12, you know, making ourselves a living offering, transforming and renewing our minds to prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of Yah. But once we tap into that, then we can start collectively creating this because this is the collective effort. This is not just an individual effort. And one of the issues I do take up with the Western theology, if you will, is that it still has an independent and individualized focus in many ways. And while the individual does prefigure, it does not take precedence over the whole, the collective. So this is where we got to get back to this. If we don't observe Sabbath, we're not just you know, sending negative energy into our life. This is reverbing to our community. There's a disturbance in the force, if you will. So if we're not, and just think about the connection we have to land. What connection do we have to land? Why is there nothing so important? In so many ways. I'm sorry, sir. I had to step away for a minute. Could you repeat that? What is our connection and the significance of land to us? That's where we get our food and nourishment. That's huge. Yes. And what we was uh, created from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual connection with land. A lot of people... Uh, Right. And, and we so, were prophets land. Ah, the prophets land. Now, this is where we're getting a little more specific. Because you keep fading out, sir. This is where it gets a little more specific because this promise is so important as relates to fulfillment and the establishment of reality on earth. And, and also, Promise was, land. Go ahead. Uh, that uh, you know, when it was talking about, and the land will be defiled. Mm -hmm. That prophecy uh, is, is also uh, the, the land is is truly tied into prophecy as well. Truly so. Mm -hmm. Truly so. Truly so. I mean, that land is the inheritance. That's Abraham and his descendants' inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And notice it says, when you come into the land which I give you. Like this, this sentence, this phrase is so important. Right? Then the land shall observe a Sabbath to Yah. And so everything is, well, let me ask you this question. What is everything predicated upon with this particular sentence that Yah speaks of in verse 2? What is everything predicated upon? You the say temple. what? The temple. The temple? Yeah, the rebuilding of the temple. So what's the temple? Oh. Uh, Israel is the people. Exactly. Okay, okay. Exactly. You're dealing with the people. Shabbat Shalom and welcome. Is it Levetta? To bake oh. machine out. Uh oh. I Shalom. Hallelujah. 
I think I just got busted in the head. Okay, she said the, the people. So the people, if the, the the people are the temple. Yes. The people have to be rebuilt. Exactly. Oh, oh my God. Rebuilt in exactly. history. Exactly. So the, oh, the people have to observe the Sabbath for the land to observe the Sabbath. Right. Nothing wow. takes place without the people. Just like if Yah's arm, if Yah doesn't do it himself, it is because it is through his people that it is done. The people prefigure. Oh my God. Wait. Pretty much in everything. We prefigure ev in everything. Right? Because this is how Yah makes itself known to humanity is through humanity. But the humanity that he chose to do his service, to do his will. Can I ask you a question? Please do. Now, I, I might be reached, but she just, when she said that about the people being the temple kind of just, but we talked about that once before. And now some scriptures are coming to my mind, right? You remember when, uh, <clears throat> when uh, over in the New Testament, when uh, the Messiah was speaking and he said that, uh, uh, that no stone should be left on another one when the temple was destroyed. Right. Right. Now we go back over to, well, first we go to Deuteronomy when he talked about, you know, when he sent us over into slavery until we be destroyed. We were utterly destroyed through through slavery. The temple right. was destroyed in slavery, right? The, the, the translated slave trade, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like, what's that word I'm looking for? How the, 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 the prophecies are sort of mirroring each other. Well, the, if, if, if Israel is the temple, we were destroyed through uh, slavery. And then the Messiah said that the, the temple will be, the, well, we know the, the actual temple. Well, we're the right. actual temple. Well, you know what I'm saying. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, right? Right. Israel so was that destroyed? Because it's just, it, was it the prophecy that we would be destroyed? And we destroyed ourselves, though, because we, we, we broke the covenant. Right. The temple was not standing first within the people. We didn't establish Yah's presence on earth through us first. Right, we were supposed so to. The temple just became form and fashion. There was no substance there anymore. That's why the Essenes completely withdrew from the precinct of the temple. The Essenes went into the wilderness. They went into Masada. They went into the Negev Desert and said, we'll carry out our own communal worship here. Mm. And they realized, you know what? We don't need that altar to make sacrifices. We'll become the sacrifice. That's that's something the Essenes realize as well. Wow. If there is no guilt or sin offering, that's why Abraham went so long without making an offering. We talked about this before too. Abraham went so long without an offering because he became the offering. Hold on. So, can I can I um say what's coming to my mind? Please do. Yeah. Um, I when 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 all of that is explained, I am thinking that uh, the Creator wants first and foremost to 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 dwell within us totally. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember there's a scripture somewhere that says, um, "Should I dwell in?" uh temples built by hands or right I, I don't remember which scripture that was but i remember that one. that was the david and king just now yes and um but we wanted to do like the other nations to e erect these uh structures to right. our creator like the other nations are doing right i think the the creator um, he allows us to go through these processes, but so that we can come to the realization that all he wants is us, basically. <laughs> and now. You know, not, not, not something that we can create um, um, by, out of uh, physical materials, but he wants to dwell within us, you know. Um, he wants to um, be uh, first and foremost uh, in our lives so that we can, you know, affect others that way. 
Mm-hmm. So that that's what came to me when we were talking. That's beautiful. That is so perfect because that is that is the case. It has always been the case. And that Yah has desired to indwell its people. What what did Yah do to bring Adam to life? He breathed into his nostrils. Okay, so he imparted a part of himself into Adam, which quickened him, right? And made him a mm-hmm. living soul. And so this is what has always been the intent, is that we are to have Yah's essence within us, that mind. And so when that mind is present, then the presence, the, 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 the presence of Yah, the Shekhinah, is also present. And that's what allows for Yah's presence on earth to be made known when the people particularly are united and gathered together. That synergy, that, that oneness, that, that vibration, it, it resounds. It resonates so profoundly of Yah's presence that no one can deny that Yah lives. The reason why the world in the 60s are saying Yah is dead is because the people of Yah were like spiritually dead. There was no presence on earth. There was no sun shining. There was no light. It was dark. Brother Kim, I do feel yes, sir. Just a quick question. I, uh, maybe What's the difference between the uh, soul and spirit? Aren't they the same? No. They're not. Okay. No. The spirit is the source of life. You're dealing with spirit ruach. Ruach is like the wind. It's like breath. The soul, one of the words for soul is neshama. Neshama. I need to finish this article. There's really five layers of of being. Neshama is like the mind. It is the personality. It is the, the emotional attributes of humanity. Okay, There's a book you. by this, he's a Christian author. His name is Watchman Nee. But he has this book. It's like a two, three part book called The Spiritual Man. It's perhaps, to me, in my opinion, one of the most clear articulations of understanding the constitution of man, of humanity. Okay. All right. Spirit, mean- soul, and body, right? I didn't want to get you cut off. It just was a quick question. I didn't no, that's not. It's fine. I mean, those are great questions to kind of, you know, contextualize everything. Yeah. Okay. But put it up mm-hmm. in the chat for me so I can. Okay, I'll find it. If someone can find Watchman Need, the spiritual man, and post that in the chat, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Thank Indeed. You. But again, I'm going back to these patterns, right? He says in verse two, the land shall observe the Sabbath. But we talked about in order for the land to observe the Sabbath, the people have to be observing the Sabbath as well. The land can't just in and of itself be like, you know what, this is the Sabbath year. It is up to the people to make the land come to life. Pardon okay. me, you said Watchman Me? Nee Watchman Me, nee. yes, ma'am. N E E. So Watchman is one word, Watchman, <laughs> and then Me, N E E. And it's called the spiritual. I just put the site in the in the chat. Hallelujah. Very powerful and profound book. Okay, great. Toda a quote. So now you're seeing these patterns. You have the weekly Sabbath again. You have the seven year Sabbath. You have the Jubilee Sabbath. Right? This is parallel, interestingly, to the time between Matzot, Matzot, Chag Matzot, Unleavened Bread, and Chag Shavuot. What is the corollary? What is the, 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 the parallel between Shavuot and the Yobel or the Jubilee? What is the, cor- what is the connection? What is the connection between the Jubilee year and the Festival of Weeks? Let's look at verse eight. 
You keep that in mind as relates to this count. That's another little clue. What's the connection? Isn't it the year that you can actually do the harvest and not festival of feast is, um, is the harvest, uh, the harvest shovel. Indeed, there's a harvest. Okay. But look Looks at the like count. The day of first fruit. Um, to a degree. There, there's some okay. degrees that are related to that. But keep in mind, right? What are you doing between Montreal and Shavuot? What are you doing? Between what now again, Sid? Between the festival of unleavened bread and the festival of weeks or Pentecost, what should you be doing? Fasting, isn't it? Fasting. What are you commanding? No, you're not fasting that time. Well, how do you know when Shavuot, when, when Pentecost comes? From matzah. By counting. So you're counting. Right, so the connection between Shavuot and Yobel, the Jubilees, is that you're counting seven Sabbaths, right? So these Sabbaths, each Sabbath is considered a prophetic week. So one seven year cycle of Sabbaths is considered a prophetic week. They'll call that a week, okay? So seven years is considered a prophetic week. But when you're dealing with the count of several weeks, you're dealing with literal weeks. Because you have seven weeks from Matzot plus a day. Seven weeks plus one day gives us several weeks. Seven years plus one year gives us the Jubilee. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. In the scripture, has there is is there a, a scripture verse that uh, 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 about the celebration that the jubilee has been celebrated? Come again, say that one more time. Has is there scripture that shows where the people celebrated a jubilee? Uh, yes, I have to find it. There are scriptures in here that talk about the Jubilee year, yes, that shows how Israel observed it. Uh huh. But this is also where the Talmud comes in. So it's a good um, reference, a good role. It plays a role in that. And a lot of people have problems with the Talmud, but the Talmud gives us context to the text. It further contextualizes it for us and gives us more applicable insight into how the Torah is carried out. So to understand the Jubilee more in detail, that's where you would look for at what had taken place um, in the Talmud. Matter of fact, let's do this. I'm gonna do the Jerusalem Talmud too. Safari. So Understanding the Jubilee. So Rabbi Haya Bar Arvin states another halakha or another ruling, another way to carry out involving property that is given to the priest with regard to a field that was consecrated by its owner and was not redeemed by him, which goes out of his possession and passes to the possession of the priest at the Jubilee year. One gives it to the members of the priestly watch serving when the Jubilee year occurred, i.e. the watch serving at the beginning of the Jubilee year. The dilemma was raised before the sages. If the beginning of the Jubilee year occurred on Shabbat. Okay, so they're having some disputations. How do we resolve these matters, right? What do we do? 
the Gemara continues with the topic of the Jubilee year. The sages taught in a barita, which is a statement about uh, the Torah. The verse states, and you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. The words, it shall be a jubilee, comes to teach that although they did not release property to its original owners, and although they did not sound the shofar, it is nevertheless a jubilee year, and the halachot of the jubilee year shall apply. The ruling and the way in which we carry this out, it is to apply. Despite if people don't do it, it should still be applicable. It should still be applied. The problem is whether or not the people do it, right? So the rules that Yah provided us for Shabbat is um, eternal. These are eternal rules that we are to institute in our daily life because they will come to pass. Laws. These are like kingdom laws. Immutable laws that allow for order to forever be established in society, in our kingdom. I mean, we know how to, we, we do know how to, uh, how it's done for the Pesach, for all the other feast days, but mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, where, where would you even know what to do for the Jubilee, because I can't find it. And and, uh, and I really don't know that much about the Talmud. Maybe I have to look at it. Uh, but even how you would you celebrate it? And because uh, I don't see anything, but you know, I don't know. Well, a lot of it has to deal with the land expressed, right? The land is so important to the Jubilee because it's related specifically to ancestral inheritance right but so, that's not for, that's not here you talk about it right Israel, right yes exactly okay exactly. now if say for instance and this is maybe it, i shouldn't ask but i'm gonna ask anyway if i went to israel how would i if, if, how would i know if i wouldn't even know what tribe i how would i know because each all the land was delegated to each tribe, right? How right. would you know what's your land? That's a great question. And that's the challenge that we face. Um, I think of the instance when there were people who claim Levitical priesthood lineage, but they couldn't prove it. They could not prove it. And so they weren't completely disqualified from, from serving, but they were just relegated to a different capacity in their serving. They weren't given <clears throat> full access to the priesthood because there was no <clears throat> direct link that they could provide Levitically to that connection. So with us, as Israel, as a national reality, you know, um, it's as such where they can probably relegate our ancestry to the kingdom of Judea, the southern kingdom, but in terms of specifically finding a tribe, it's one of three, you know, and that's the challenge for us in that are we Judah, are we Benjamin, are we Levi, you know, who are we? So to really say we're Judah, it's still a shot in the dark in ways, unless we can literally trace our lineage back to that tribe. But what Mashiach says is so important in that the sheep hear his voice. You know, we can say we're Israel definitively. We can't say that we're Yahuda definitively. We can't say that we're Levi definitively. We can't say that we're Benjamin definitively. And even though you do have one West charts in Israelite camps that say, you know, the Puerto Ricans of this tribe, you know, the Americans of that tribe, so and so, that's still, you know, a stretch. That's a far stretch. And even if they use the scriptures to like Genesis what is that, 49 to uh, supposedly identify who these people are in the end times, it's still a stretch. It's still a large stretch. And so I would say, this is just me speaking now, let me delineate that. I would say it's safer to identify as Israel as a more opposed to like Yahuda. 
Let Yah sort that out. Let Yah place us in the place where we're supposed to be. Let Yah reveal to us to which tribe we belong. But that's a that's 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 not the important thing. The important thing is that we keep the commandments, right? And we fear Yah. That's what's important. We're back in this covenant. You know, a lot of people wolf and holler and you know, I'm Judah, I'm Judah, Judah, Judah. Then live like Judah. That's what Shaul says in <clears throat> Romans 2. If you call yourself a Yahudi and you're a teacher of those who are ignorant, you know, teach yourself. And I'm not saying that no one in here is doing that. Everyone in here I know is doing that. But what I'm saying is for those of our brothers and sisters that are, you know, laboring, and that we were talking about earlier, not really shedding love because that's what delineates Israel from everything. And love is in truth, but it's also with compassion and it is to be allocated appropriately and proportionately. So um, it's a lot, but I would say, and this again, this is Mikael speaking, um, Focus on the Torah. Focus on, you know, this covenant. The, the nailing down which tribe we belong to, that's, that's, you know, that's flesh and blood. That's not entering the kingdom. Keep them commandments. That's what's going to get you in the kingdom. Does that make sense, Ima? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, I don't see any other way to do it because I don't know. I would never know. But I do know that we are supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. We are supposed Amen. to keep the command. We do have enough information through the word to get out of here <laughs> when it comes. Now, whether you do it or not, that would be on you. You right. know, but we do have enough information to keep his commandments. Hands down. And that's what's important. That's what Sh uh, Shlomo, Malek Shlomo, King Solomon said is the conclusion of the matter. Fear Elohim and keep his commandments. <clears throat> that's all we do. So that's what's important. So notice, when does the Jubilee year start? What day does the Jubilee year actually start? Anyone know? Nope. I'm sorry. Verse, um, verse nine. Yes. Nine. On Yom Kippur, what they call the Shemitah. This is dealing with the Shemitah year. The year. What does Shemitah mean? Anybody remember what Shemitah means? The year of what? Anybody familiar with that word Shemitah? Shemitah. It's not Shemitah. It's Shemitah. So you're dealing with what is sabbatical. called the year. I'm sorry? Sabbatical year. It's a sabbatical year, but what takes place during the sabbatical year? Uh, the ag agricultural cycle. Okay, that's a part of it. It's a, it's, a, it's a year of rest for the land. But what else takes place? There's some other things that take place. Uh, it's a release of debt. There you go. You're dealing with a year of release. This is what y'all are still speaking about. To, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah. Right? When you go to Isaiah 60. And you see all the things that he proclaims, what he's talking about in essence is in fact the Shemitah year. What does that entail? Well, he says in this chapter that he quotes from Isaiah, he talks about 
binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming release to the captives, opening the prisons to those who are bound, proclaiming the acceptable year of Yah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all who mourn, appoint unto those who mourn in Sion, give embellishment for ashes, oil for joy for mourning, garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, right? All these things here, the rebuilding of old ruins, raising up the former waste, restoring the ruined cities, all of this here is about Yobel or Jubilee. All of this is about Jubilee. And so when we're dealing with this, this acceptable year of Yah, this is about the year of release. Now, what is this do? What does this do for society? Let's think about this. If you're releasing debt, you're getting people out of prison, you're, you're actually, if anyone is indentured to someone, their service is binding. What does this do to society? Well, I mean, you could it, you could look at it as a boost to the economy, um, and the, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. You look at it, you can look at it as a boost of to economy, in a sense. Um, okay, that's the one way to look at it. What happens with the people? It, they relax, I guess. They, they, the stress is not there for having to owe anybody or being in prison. Or... Come on now. Yeah. Exactly. You're leveling yeah. the field for everybody again. Mm -hmm. You're starting off or over at zero for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you have an opportunity as you hit this reset button to start over and, and to get back into a place of comfort. Now you have no you have no debt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. We forgive our debt owers, right? And your yeah. land is returned, and your mm -hmm. loved ones is, are returned. So you can like begin on, uh, to start. farm or you know, whatever when you think about it. It's like coming out of bankruptcy for some people. Yes. Exactly. And this this mm -hmm eliminates oppression, it eliminates exploitation, it eliminates all the different social ills that are present in society. It, it, it alleviates crime, right? There is a crescendo effect that reverberates throughout all of society because you're giving people an opportunity again to start over and to get back into a good position economically, right? Mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's hard to spiritually conduct yourself if you're indebted to somebody and you're working mm -hmm. in a way that I don't want to do. You're, you're humiliated in a sense. So your spiritual well-being is not optimally functioning. So these are things that allows for humanity to heal and to experience, here's the key word again, Ga'al, redemption. How can you have a nation meant to redeem the world in a state of not being redeemed, in a state <laughs> of bondage? Yes. You're in bondage to even emotional debt. If you're in bondage to physical debt, right? Material debt, economic debt, financial debt. If you're in bondage, what type of redemption can you bring to humanity? You don't know anything about redemption. So these are the things that we're thinking about as we're seeking to understand this process. Yes, Ima. Yes, indeed. Go ahead. Every time I, I will say, every time I read this, I think about how many jubilees uh, our people 
were and, and all over the world, I don't want to just say here in the United States, were uh, striving under um, slavery. And, you know, right. and, and, and the Jubilee went by. Right. Yep. You if know. I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. 1965 was a Jubilee. Wow. 2015 was a Jubilee. And so now we have another Jubilee coming up in 2065 again. So that's a little ways down the road. But we've experienced the Jubilee as recently as 2015. And a lot of things were taking place in 2015 that were um, very intense. Uh, there was a year of return. They called it a year of return, I believe, when a lot of mm -hmm, African descendants started going back to the continent. That was a huge year for that. Of course, 1965. Hurricane Betsy. In New Orleans. Hey, La. Mm -hmm. I was born that year. Mm -hmm. My mind. 65? Yes. <laughs> hey, La. But that was also the Civil Rights Act. Right? That formally, formerly eliminated, supposedly, it was supposed to be the elimination of anything, any vestige of, of enslavement. Of course, Jim Crow was the last vestige that we know of. There's still, of course, vestiges, but that was a year of release. Going back before that. 1915, what did that be? 1915 was another big year for African-Americans. And of course, 1865 was the year that, you know, proclamation, proclamation around that time. When you look at these. Wasn't there a lot of like race riots and Things like well, I guess I will have to look and see. Maybe Brother East Staff knows. You saying right, right, right. you, you you're saying that can see Well, a lot of race riots occurred like a couple of years after that, 1917 and 1919. Uh, uh, uh -huh. 1915, uh, that's the year Booker T. Washington died. Uh, and he was considered the spokesperson for the black race uh during that time period um mm -hmm. i was trying to think of some other significant things that happened uh so this wasn't necessarily race this, we were about to enter into world war uh, one and uh jim crow segregation was in in full effect definitely yeah um mm -hmm. let me see that's the only thing right now that comes to mind. Uh, maybe I'm, I may be missing something. I'm sure. I'm right going now. through something and looking at what's going on in the United States um, for that year. Did you see August 17th there that a um, Jewish person was lynched? Lynched. Wow. Well, hmm. Hmm. Wow. And Woodrow Wilson was president and he, you know, mm -hmm. Blacks had thought that they had made certain gains and he took them back at the federal level where he segregated all federal facilities. And um, so, you know, black were, Blacks were shot at that. Um, mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a Democrat, um, if that means anything. Um, So this is the round World War I, too, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, well, US occupied Haiti during that time. I saw that. Yeah. The Panama Canal, the Suez Canal, uh, Turkish and army, uh, German army. Yeah. Uh, um, birth of uh, a Nation was released. The birth of a Nation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sister Nicola uh, mentioned that um, the United States occupied Haiti. Um, uh -huh. There's a, uh -huh. a new, there's a New York Times article. I was able to send it to Ema. See if you can find it. I think it just came out today about the history of France and Haiti. I yep. think I posted in our room. You did, you yes, ma'am. 
Yes, ma'am. And I, I just really thought about, um, you know, the Jubilee and, and all of it and how they, um, what can I call backwards, uh -huh. backwardly gave them uh, their redemption, charging them all the way. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Yeah, that's that's something I'm gonna try to take some more time to read. If any, okay. if you all could, yeah, that's a good one. So there's a lot of things that take place, you know, historically around these jubilee years that we can just be mindful of, um, without really chasing the rabbit down the hole that deep. With that matter, these are things that we have to reckon ourselves. And, and, and how? Here's a question: How do jubilees take place? How does how do Sabbath days take place? What is the imperative for these matters to to occur? I, I think we have to be on the accord about the Sabbath day. They it, yes, and indeed. we go back to like with community, just like we're doing now, but on a bigger sense. Um, if if we've all ever you know, experience coming together on the Sabbath is something about it because everybody's going to the store and doing their own thing. And you come out of the house dressed to go worship on that day, you know? Right, 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 right. And that's exactly it. We have to observe it. It has to be observed. We have to actually go about carrying the will of Yah out in order for these things to materialize. Now, ideally, it would be more powerful in community with one another. If we're just scattered and dispersed and disaggregated in our efforts to serve Yah, it won't have the impact as if we were together in doing this. That's why that cloud of witnesses is so important because a cloud is a gathering. It is a conglomeration. It is a, you know, a convocation of, of, of the Kedoshim, the saints, the set apart ones. And that's why Yah is calling us to our land of inheritance. Again, to make our presence in his presence in us pronounced. Israel was scattered for a reason. Think about it. Why did the nation, why did Yah allow the nations to scatter us? What's the significance of that? Well, also, so everyone would have a sense of who we are or, um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. That's one side of it, yeah. I think but so he could that, separate us from them so that we can know who we are, uh, mostly. Um, and also like to, to really just keep us away from their practices and so that we can, we, can, we can make sure that we're following what we're supposed to follow. Somewhat, but think about it. If, if, if you have a team that is strong and the only way to break that to beat that team is to break them up right and to send different players to different teams you're going to weaken the team it's the same with israel israel is is strongest when we're united and we're gathered that's why yah tells us to gather together he says this in genesis 49 he says this in Zechariah. He says this in Joel. Gather together, O nation, not to be desired. The world does not desire for Israel to be gathered together because the world knows when Israel is united, every kingdom is coming down. So that's the kingdom that's going to be. That's the only kingdom that's going to be up. When we're carrying out Yah's will and we're keeping these Sabbath days and we're observing these jubilees, and we're carrying forth Yah's will, there's nothing that can stand against us. There's nothing that can stand against us because we have returned to the covenant and that covenant keeps us protected. It's just like 
a, a husband and a wife, as long as the spouses are honoring their agreement, everything is going to flow. When a spouse decides to step outside of that agreement and do something that is not agreed upon, that's when troubles arise. It's the same principle with Yah. Yah will cover us as long as we're in alignment with his will. And that's what this is all about. This is about fairness. This is about equity. This is about justice. And that's the whole thing about Torah. The Torah is so practical. And it's so concerned with social justice and social harmony, which makes it so profoundly divine, but yet profoundly human at the same time, because its outcome is Jerusalem. But that's not just the location in Israel, that is a worldly reality. That's a world of peace. It is a repaired world. This is all about repairing ages. This is all about repairing the covenant. This is all about repairing ourselves. And I'm sure everyone in this room can say that we've experienced trauma, we've experienced pain, we've experienced brokenness. Well, how do we repair that? But through repentance. That's where healing comes from. Our healing comes from the Torah. Healing to your navel and, and wellness to your bones. That's what Proverbs 3 tells us that wisdom is. And the wisdom we know is Torah. But this also holds us accountable to one another. When you sell whatever to your neighbor or buy from the hand of your neighbor, don't exploit one another. Right? Make sure everything is fair and equitable. Don't try to get over on me. Or don't try to undercut me. Hey, hook, let your boy get the hookup. You're frauding me. You're, you're carrying out fraud by doing that. You're exploiting me and my kindness. No, this is business. This has nothing to do about personal. We're doing business. This is fair and equitable business. Right? Do not oppress one another, but you shall fear your Elohim, for I am Yah your Elohim. Do my laws, guard my right rulings, and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety, and the land shall yield its fruit. You shall eat to satisfaction and shall dwell there in safety. We were just talking about before this class started, I ain't going down there because they carjacking people even on the freeway, and he's a 12, 13 year old. That's not safety. That's not being able to enjoy the fruit of the land and eating and sat eating to satisfaction. That's that's not desirable. And we're saying that this is all over the place. Not just in New Orleans, not just in Chicago, it's not just in Kansas City. It's all over the place. And the reason for that, well, let me ask you all this. Why, what is the reason for that? Why is the world experiencing all these travesties? Slower. Why do you say the world is experiencing all these travesties? Not just that we broke covenant, but growing pains, right? That's a part of it, but... Some well, of these I things think, aren't necessary. Yeah, I think it's part of a scripture is supposed to play out like this, for one. Uh, and then, you know, due to the overuse of the land, it's going to spit you out. Um, and that's what's happening now, I believe. Uh, because we have given a land no rest at all. Um, we, we exploit it as much as possible. And so I think in turn, it will just, it's spitting us out now. So what, what's that a reflection of? 
It's a reflection of our behavior, of our, of our, of, of our uh, disobedience, our mockery, uh, all of that. Mm-hmm. Idolatry. Exactly. Exactly. Our estrangement, estrangement to the covenant. And so only by returning to the covenant will these things right themselves. Because here's the thing, when Israel is redeemed as a nation, the idea is that the world will be redeemed immediately following because Israel is intended to be the light to the Gentiles, the light to the nations. Israel is intended to be the head of the nations. But this is only done in righteousness. This is only done in truth. This is only done in love. This is only done in and with equity, justice, right? That's the only way these things are going to be righted. The world will only be righted and repaired when the right types of repairs take place with the world. And it will only take place through the people. There's nothing that's magically going to happen on this earth. It's, not, it's going to require work. It's going to require labor of love, selfless labor of love. And each of us have a role to play with that. Where does the work begin? With us. Where does, exactly. With work. us and in our homes. Yes, ma'am. That's where the work of redemption commences. With ourselves first, each and every one of us has the responsibility to repair ourselves. Then from there, our families. Then from there, our community. From there, it just expands out until we touch the entire world. And when you look at the methodology of Yahushua, who selected 12 men, each of those 12 men had to first and foremost undergo Teshuvah. They all had to go undergo repentance. And it wasn't something that was a one-time thing. They were daily going through repentance because they were daily dealing with themselves. And this is all a part of Jubilee. Because here's the question. More times than not, what gets people in debt? What makes people trespass? Greed. 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 Black. Lack of self-discipline. So how do you go about experiencing lack typically? What happens? Um overindulgence. Uh, uh, typically. Uh, lack of self-control. Hardship. <laughs> yeah. But what breeds hardship though, typically? Well, I mean, anything can lead to hardship, uh, especially in today's society, uh, a loss of job, uh, or for women, a loss of a spouse, uh, uh, uh or well, not just necessarily man too, a loss of a spouse, a loss of income, uh -huh. uh, uh, a illness, sickness. Uh, okay. Somebody has, you know, I've, I've known people that had uh, uh, strokes or, or heart attack or something like that and end up uh, losing their job, losing their home. So the question is, why though? Why did all that happen? What's the purpose of all that? There's, is there a reason for it? Is there well, I, I would say partly idolatry. Because our relationship with the Most High is is lacking, uh, he's he's very jealous. So if he he sees it, his attention is diverted. He does, he brings things uh, into your life that will draw you nearer to him, and a lot of times it's uh, it's peril. Um, so it, it's begin this when we step away from that covenant, when we no longer seek him, is when and when we break that covenant, step away from the covenant. Um, of what we know, because uh, you're, you're especially when you know, uh, that's when you experience uh, hardship. Yep. And 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 not just that, you know. Uh, I I was what came to mind when Brother Eric was speaking uh, uh, that that scripture uh, when the disciples asked uh, Yahshua, he said. Uh, do uh, you remember the guys they were building? I think it was a wall or something like that, and, and it collapsed and killed some people, killed three of them or something of that nature. And, and, yep. And and the father and they asked him, he said, "Who did sin that these men should die?" 
that their mother or their father, he said, no, no mother nor their father uh, uh, sin. Uh, no one sinned. They died so that uh, uh, that the glory of, of the Most High may be manifested or something of that nature. I hate to, but you know which one I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with it. And and so you know uh, sometimes you know uh, that hardship is brought about uh, not just uh, just for the, not in that same instance as Brother Eric was speaking about but through idolatry and things like that, but it's also brought about so that the most so that a lot of other folks can can, can uh, take a look around and, and glorify the Most High. All of it's about His glory, and all of it is about His praise, and and so. Uh, you know, it, it, it might be just like uh, with uh, Brother Joe. Yep. You know what I mean? You know, the, the, you know his, 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 his sons and them were wiped out. And his daughters too. Everybody, <laughs> the most high took everything. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it, just so he could teach Job a lesson, right? And, and that's one of the instances that Brother Eric was speaking about. But And you, you got to also keep in mind, we will be tested. That too, yeah. We will be tested to see what caliber our alloy is, what we're made of. You know, if we are truly the children of Elohim, we should be able to endure all things, right? The scriptures tell us that, you know, blessed is he who endures unto the end. This is the blessings that Yah is wanting to give us, but he's got to see if we're worthy to receive those blessings. When we cave in under circumstances that aren't going to be permanent, but that are trying and challenging for us, but we still maintain our, our morality and our ethical code, or will we compromise and give in because of a circumstance that is truly a challenge? Because once we get into power, what will you do with that? If you don't know how to conduct yourself when you're at your lowest, how are you going to conduct yourself at your height? If you're not a faithful steward over little, how are you going to be faithful with great and much? And this is what this is all principally pointing to. When we're dealing with these jubilees, when we're dealing with these Sabbath days, and we're dealing with justice and not oppressing and exploiting, it's so easy to forget these things when you're in power, because now that you're in power, you can have a whole different interest set. You can have a whole different outlook on like, you didn't see things from this vantage point before. Now that you got these resources, now that you got this authority, now that you got these, you know, individuals subject to you and are, are, are literally at times even worshiping you because of your great reach now. You look at what happens to, to, to uh, celebrities when they get paid. They lose their minds. They come from humble beginnings and all of a sudden they forget every beginning that ever took place in their life. But don't the scriptures say you have the poor with you always? It does say that. It does say that. It it happens that um you know uh that people and I'm not trying to make any excuses, but I'm just saying there are people that are poor, there are people that are uh even born uh with uh uh disabilities and and, and what have you. Mm -hmm. What you know, I mean, we know as a people, you should be able to maybe share. Well, not maybe, you should. You know, we'll have three cars and won't even give one person that don't, that's walking, we won't even, you know, give them a ride. You right. know, I mean, that has, that has been our, uh, 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 our behavior. We have these things and maybe that's what, when Yahshua say you have the poor with you always, but what are you going to do about it? Do uh, you know? I think it was in Corinthians when I, uh, you know, it was better that they had everything common. If you had a car, an extra car, give somebody else a car. I'm just saying. Um, you know, if you uh, if you got five bedrooms, what's wrong with somebody else taking 
a bedroom that's on the street. I, I, I'm, I'm really trying to understand what you're saying because people in their difficulties and their circumstances, um, they do happen. And we already know you can't always call it sin because uh, y'all sure didn't always call it sin. What did, what did it, I think it was the blind man. Well, they didn't, nobody did nothing. I mean, some things are to the glory of y'all. So, right. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand. 100%. I mean, these, again, those are the tests and the trials that can also happen though as well. Um, you're dealing with hardship and circumstances like that, you know, you're only as good as your most recent test. You know, you're only as, as, as rooted <laughs> as the storm you endure, right? They say a tree with deep roots doesn't worry about strong winds. So it's like, if, you're, if you are who you say you are, when you go through these trials, you're proving yourself. I mean, I understand what uh, 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 said, Saul said, where he said that, um, that, you know, whatever lot that you find yourself in, you know, to be, be content, he said, I've been poor, I've been rich, right. and I'm not quoting it right, I know, but I whatever did, you know, lot I find myself in, I, I'm going to be content there. Just because you lost your job, that don't mean you're supposed to go stick up the bank. You know, right. you don't have to fall in sin because of your circumstances. Because I, I know for a fact that Yah will step in. He'll send, I, I call him uh, the, the angels here on earth that will help you. I mean, you don't have to give in to the, um, uh, uh, you know, to the things that, that come on you. That's why I love the book of, uh, of Job so much, you know, even though he lost, he his body was stricken, you know, uh, he, you know, uh, we even know what his wife, his companion said, curse your yard and die. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the problem is that sometimes that the circumstances can get overwhelming. They can be overwhelming. And um, that, you know, pain, um, maybe being outdoors, I don't know. This is, as a community, that's where the, I think we got to be helpers to one another because sometimes you have to help lift up somebody, not uh, they just over there by themselves. Um, we got uh, people that lay up in their house and die uh, like, of uh, some of the women we read in the um on the news you you know it's hot you know they don't have no air condition but you you don't do nothing right who are we if we don't right. do nothing there right. are times that we go you talking about testing sure they get the test but so do you to see what how you gonna act what are you going to do when you see somebody in a circumstance? There's been times when you go to a grocery store, and I'm sorry to take up so much time. No, you're wonderful. When you go to the grocery store and somebody turn around and say, look, I, and you have to put your grocery back. They say, oh, no, no, no. Don't put your grocery back. I'll pay for them. That's the kind of help you look for. But what about you meet up with some hard co-person? Yeah, put them on groceries. Like you shouldn't have been in the line in the first place. Right. So, you know, it's, it's not just the person that's going through, but how you want to react as to, to help somebody. What you going to do? And right. we don't have enough of that, even though these people be tested. But as you say, tested and, and be sick, it's, it's heartbreaking. You go to the hospital and you see people trying to drag around a wheelchair, especially the seniors, and they got nobody, nobody right. to help them to get around. It's, it's heartbreaking when you 
you know, I remember I would go to the hospital with my mom and I'm taking her wheelchair all I know. And then the other seniors are sitting there, pick out nobody to help them or somebody disabled, nobody to help. I, that's what I can you you can I say well let me help you let me let me do this let me do what I can but it ain't it's not enough that the of, of the people you say we supposed to be visible yeah we in all different places we supposed to be visible to show the world who we supposed to be are but uh, our light is so dim mm -hmm. yep and that's the challenge. That's the challenge we all face. Shabbat shalom, brother Akraya. And, and, and I'm going to point to this verse here, Ima, because it, it, it comes down, again, to the, to the end result. You know, uh, my mother used to tell me, we've mentioned this before, it's not what happens to you, but how you handle it, right? Um, this I just is, want... uh, let me just read this real quick, E. This okay. is from 1 Peter chapter 4. It says, beloved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is coming upon you to try you as though some unusual matter has befallen you. But as you share Mashiach's sufferings, rejoice in order that you might rejoice exultingly at the revelation of his esteem. If you are reproached for the name of Messiah, you are blessed because the spirit of esteem and of Elohim rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is praised. But do not let any of you suffer as a murderer, thief, doer of evil, or meddler. But if one suffers being messianic, let him not be ashamed, but let him esteem Elohim in this matter. Because it is time for judgment to begin from the house of Elohim. And if firstly from us, what is the end of those who do not obey the good news of Elohim? And if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall the wicked and the sinner appear? So then, those who suffer according to the desire of Elohim should commit their lives to a trustworthy creator in doing good. So this is about endurance again. This is about overcoming. This is about being principled and sticking to the guns that you know you're supposed to be blazing. That's what this is about. East Staff, what were you going to say, brother? Um, when we were talking about the uh, year of Jubilee, um, we, and we were talking about what happened in 1915, uh, that's 50 years after the freeing of the slaves uh, here in Missouri. So uh, January, uh, January of 1865, that's when the slaves in Missouri were set free. And so 50 years after that, that would have been uh, 1915. So, oh, that wow. is, so that's some significance about the, uh, the year of Jubilee is when the, the slaves here in Missouri were set free. And 65 was a Jubilee year. Yeah, 1865 would have been. Yes, 1865 was a Jubilee year, 1915. Yep. Uh, was the next year. And that would have been 50 years after the slaves in Missouri were set free. They lie. Told off for that. Told off for that. So as relates to this land, keep in mind, this land is supposed to be the beacon, the, the, the city on a hill for all other lands on earth. So when this land is operating in and with excellence. And it is carrying out all of the functions that the, the landlord, the creator, the owner of that plot of land is, 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 has commanded his tenants to carry out. Well, then you will see that land, and not only that land, but the entire world in order. So what Yah is doing is setting up a self-sustaining system. We talk, well, not we, the world, particularly the United Nations, is, to, is talking about this sustainable development plan. But here's the question. What is one of the most important 
methods of carrying out this sustainability plan that the United Nations is, is, is wanting to carry out? What is something that has to take place according to this plan? Eliminating some people. Exactly, depopulation. There has to be a reduction in population. Now, where does that sit with scripture? What does the scriptures tell us to do? The scriptures tell us to be fruitful and multiply. Oh, so somebody's being very antagonistic to life. If sustainable development requires depopulation as opposed to what the scriptures tell us to do is be fruitful and multiply, who's who and what's what? If death is the way to go about accomplishing life, I don't want any part of that. And Yah is not anywhere a part of that. So we have to really examine these things. If, if the way the world is going to come into a, a place of homeostasis and you're going to see more uh, um, balanced climates and you're going to see you know, environments that are that are sustainable and, and, and populations that are growing and proliferating and, 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 and healthy. Now, not to say death is not a part of the cycle and the process, but it is not the prefigured factor. If I got to depopulate the earth by some 6.5 billion, which is what the Georgia Guidestones want to return, how much? I think it said they want the world to 5.5 million. That's a depopulation of 6.5 billion people. That's kind of demonic. Not kind of, that's just outright demonic. Therein lies the creation of COVID. Yep, and HIV. Right, and all these other diseases that they're creating carrying out and the 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 heavy metals in the 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 sky from chemtrails and the weather manipulation so many man the, the 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 police terrorism the mass shooters all of this stuff is going hand in hand together with it it all comes together if you see the silver lining through that you can see it through anything These things are not just randomly happening. Could that be the spirit that's being poured on them? I mean, we know that on, according to Revelation, you know, the, the spirit of uh, Wormwood, or the, or the, or the, or the, or the famine and the sword. Those four, those four horses of the apocalypse. Yeah, the four horses. Do you think that could be the reason? You know, that spirit causing them to make that that uh, prophecy come true, or? Undeniably, this is all prophetic. Everything that's taking place is prophetic, whether people know it or not. These things are, are, are orchestrated. These things are not just like, you know what? I'm just going to go and be a lone shooter. This damn devil in Buffalo, just like the devil in Pasadena that had this church shooting of the Presbyterians in, uh, in, in, in California, Orange County, none of these things are isolated events. If we look at these things as isolated events, we're missing the connections. This is a puzzle. What we're dealing with is a jigsaw puzzle with, I will say, millions of pieces. But if you just look at these things as disconnected and disconcerted and isolated, you're not going to see what's really taking place. You're not. There's a connection to everything on Earth. Everything is connected. Nothing is disjointed. And so this is what we have to see. And this is why Israel is so important in this as a people and the land, because it is through the people first, then the land functioning under the stewardship of the people that the world will see what truth looks like. All of this has to come down. And how we treat one another is so important. When we read Parshat Kedoshim, the set of part ones, 
Yahushua tells us the second most important commandment was found there. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Then is that vital? Is that vital? Brother Kim, I saw your hand. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I was wondering if when you were saying that we have to recognize the things that are going on, is that does that speak to uh, what the Bible talks about, the mystery of iniquity? Does that have anything to do with it? Oh, undeniably. The secret of lawlessness, undeniably. Because love will wax cold, lawlessness will increase. That's what Yahushua tells us in Matthew 24. But that Thessalonians chapter 3, second Thessalonians chapter 3, the mystery of iniquity, undeniably. And this is where it all comes down to. You're dealing with the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent is going to be in extreme hostility against the seed of the woman. That goes back to Revelation 12. With the woman clothed in the sun, standing on the moon with the crown of 12 stars, about to give birth, and another great sign with the red dragon at her feet to consume this child as soon as it was born. This has always been the polarity that's been present on earth, the light and the darkness. This goes back to Genesis 1. Light and darkness, water and water, earth and water. All of this is a separation. And what we're seeing is a pronouncement of the wicked and a pronouncement of the righteous. Will the real nation of Israel please stand up? Because the world is waiting on us. Creation is waiting on us. Who is willing to go and initiate the process to repair this age? It's not gonna get better by itself. It ain't gonna happen without the efforts that are taken to repair it, starting with ourselves. And it's so deep because we, we all play a, an essential role in the repair of this world because our actions, our words, and our thoughts are like a ripple effect. Our thoughts ripple, our words ripple, and our actions ripple into the sea of humanity. What's that? So everything we do, it, it has an impact. And those waves go out and they touch things. It may be subtle or it may be a tsunami. But everything we do has an impact one way, shape, form, or fashion. Brother Kim, what's that? Yeah, I, I was uh, while you were talking, I was remembering back in the, in uh, I believe that was in uh, Exodus when uh, Moshe and, and our ancestors came out, right? And uh, the Most High took a tenth of Israel, which was a Levite, to Himself. Mm -hmm. right? and I said, "Take a tithe unto myself," which was a tenth of Israel. Right. And one thing that was I, I was always trying to make this connection, right? But you know, He said two thirds of Israel will perish. Right, and that there was going to be uh, uh, outside of the 144,000 that was sealed, right? They were sealed, but he's he's only going to come for a, a. I was wondering that that remnant that he talked about, he was coming for that remnant. Does that remnant equal a tithe, or is that remnant a portion or the tenth part of Israel that shall be saved? That's a great question. I, I, I'm not certain what the number is going to be 144,000. Well, I'm not. Yeah, but I, I knew the 144,000, right? That that was those are the ones that are going to be sealed, just sealed, right? right? You know, right. Because then there's a number after that no man can count. Right. Yeah, there's a number after that that no man can count, right? And so, but we and I was wondering that part where the the number that no man can count is that uh, is he going to take a, a tithe or a tenth part of Israel like he did before, right? And then once that tenth part is 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 uh, accounted to him once that tithe is paid from Israel, will that then that the that 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 part of Israel or that Israel, will they be the ones to usher in uh the Messiah? Like you said, it, at any time Israel can usher in the Messiah. 
when that part or when that that portion is taken will it be that portion that is that will it be that portion that enters or ushers in the second coming of the messiah if that that's sense. something to definitely study and investigate i have no answers for that now but that's something that we can look into and definitely uh, unfold that's that's a great question but did, did it make sense I it, was, does. it does i was thinking about that the last time you were talking and you were telling when that, that had always stuck with me when you said in israel could usher in the Messiah at any time. But when you said that, I got to really thinking about it. That's why I love the Shabbat, right? But I was wondering about that, you know? And so that when you just hit on it again, so I was wondering. Indeed, indeed. And that's something that um, we just read this here. Uh, this sentence here, in other words, the redemption of Israel materializes when they merit the redemption, when they are righteous and immersed in Torah, right? So this lets us know that redemption, Mashiach can return at any time. That's why he says, the strong man of the house is gonna stay up and watch as the thief breaks in, right? He's not gonna allow the thief just to break in and just ransack stuff. No, you're gonna be prepared. The son of man will return like a thief in the night. But if you are, if you're staying ready, you don't have to get ready. That's like the 10 wives, the 10 virgins. Five were ready, five were not. I was just thinking about that, sir. I promise you, I was just thinking about that. Yes, sir. So with Israel, the more prepared we are, the more in position we are, right? The more uh that apart we are, the closer we are to experiencing the redemption, our redemption. And this is just about being observant. This is about being faithful and steadfast and, 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 and clinging to Yah and this covenant. And, and it kind of goes right when you were talking about those 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 ones that were there was part of them that wasn't ready they didn't have they all they were trying to sell it. they were trying to get get their stuff together to go to the wedding and but there was the, that one that was prepared right right and 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 that's what I'm saying it's it's like you know because all Israel ain't Israel right and uh, it's it's the circumcision of the heart right there it is. And and so if, if if we have to make sure that we are the one that has the wine or, or the oil, right? Yes, because sir. we understand that there's a, a portion of our people that will not be saved. They will listen. That hey, he's not the coming Lord. for you know. And I, I remember uh, he's not coming for everybody. That's not just including a lot of those other heathenistic nations, right? The ones who are right. lost the way that because Israel never took that to them, right? Because we never lived up to that portion a reason why we were created, but also that, you know, it's one hard pill for me that I had to sw uh, swallow, right, is that a lot of my friends and a lot of my relatives will not, you know what I mean, because they, they hearts are hard and they, because he said the fearful and the unbelieving will also have their part in the lake that burns with fire. So yep. because they don't believe, that's going to keep them out of the gate, you know what I mean? So that's why Undeniably. unfortunately you're very true. That is very true. Yeah. That is very true. And it's not about just saying you believe, it's about serving. It's about demonstrating our faith through obedience to this covenant. Faithfulness to the covenant. I think that's a better way to put it. A lot of people have a hard time processing the word obedience. But if you understand it, you understand it as fidelity, right? If you understand it is loyalty. This is what this is about. Our allegiance and our alignment. That's what this is about. And so redemption. This is all about redemption too. Now here's my question. What is redemption? We've gone over this before. What is redemption? Torah. No. But, okay, let's get a little more particular. What is redemption, uh, though? Yeah, we did go over this before. Uh, uh, let me see. 
Let's look the word up in English first. So to have to to redeem to have been redeemed means that you have been um, mm -hmm. that, that you have been uh, let's say sinful or to have been redeemed from something means that you have been in a bad state or right. have done something bad. So uh, a redeem is is a uh, in a sense a, a, a restoration, a a coming back to par. Um, so to having been she has a redeem some redeeming qualities. <laughs> so meaning that she's good, she's bad at this, but she's good at that. So that's what uh, Excuse me. It, it means to make up. Say la. Yes, indeed. So when we look at it in English, when you're dealing with the word redemption, you're dealing with the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. A thing that saves someone from error or evil the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. The buying or the action of buying one's freedom, but it comes from a word meaning to buy back. You're buying it, but you're taking it back from where it got turned over to, right? In the Hebrew, redemption, geulah, is an implication of a relationship, the kindred, to redeem by the right of redemption. Your right, to get your rights back, but it comes from a word that means uh, to deliver, to purchase, or to ransom, even to revenge, to carry out revenge in the act of redemption. And so it requires blood, right, at times. That's what Mashiach did. He redeemed us through his blood. It's an, in a sense, it's an atonement. But this is about, really, this is about relationship. When you're dealing with this in the Hebraic concept, you're in the construct, you're dealing with relationship. There's a relationship of, of human, human to human. Is that the relationship? human to land and they're all symbiotically connected we depend on we co-depend we excuse me we interdepend on one another both people and land there's an interdependence that exists that if one of them is in balance if we exploit or, or oppress the land if we exploit or oppress our neighbor there's going to be a default and there's going to be consequences and recourses that are going to demonstrate that imbalance. The fruit will demonstrate that. It's either going to be rotten fruit or it's going to be quality fruit. And With both uh, both redeem and relationship have the same prefix, um, which also means recycle uh restore mm -hmm. so it all reciprocate yeah it means to to do unto others as you would have them do unto you which was what reciprocate means yep and that's the rule that's what i say love your neighbor as you love yourself Tom. it's a it's a recycle exactly exactly so as we're dealing with this redemption right and those who are the redeemers, you know, there has to be the uh, someone has to have the authority to to claim that which is redeemed. They have to have the authority in the sense of of, of their right to redeem, but also they have to have the resources to redeem. So it's not just like, you know, you can just claim it and then not 
actually go about making the exchange for you have to make the exchange there has to be someone who can make that exchange and it, it goes back to the covenant that we made with uh with the most high and the exchange is if we do what he says that if we do what we're supposed to do we will receive all these blessings right and and yep. so and so will the land and they, like I said, that's the coexistence. That's the symbiotic relationship that exists. Everything is in relationship with one another, right? And this is why I was saying, even with like, you know, if one of our brothers or sisters becomes poor and his hand has failed with us, sustain him, right? But don't take interest or profit. Don't lend it interest or profit. This is about just, equity. This is about giving people an opportunity to get back on their feet. What happens in society where capitalism exists, they're going to beat you into the ground. Because they're not worried about you. They don't value the human. They value the material. They worship the material. And so as a result of that, the human becomes just you know, fodder. It becomes just energy, expendable energy in a system that just recycles people like batteries. But in the kingdom, this is where people are actually valued. This is where true value comes. So let's take the Tower of Babel. In the Tower of Babel, when they were building the tower, if a brick fell, everybody would mourn. But if a human fell off a ladder and died, they would just keep working as if nothing happened. But let a brick fall. This is in the book of Jasher. They would mourn because the, the, the material became more important than the people. And this is where we are here. And this is what this redemption is to teach us here. This is why we focus on the human with this jubilee process, because if it's all about profit, well, shit, I don't care how much you in debt. Excuse my language. I don't care how much you're in debt. You're gonna keep amassing debt as opposed to, you know what? This is the seventh year. I'm gonna pardon you. I'm gonna give you a, a fresh start. No, these are lifelong debts that will go on to the next generation if they're not settled. There's no compassion in that. There's no human like element in that. That's just straight, just just greed. But I did see your hand, Brother Kim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, when, when you were talking about that, you know, I'm just here to listen. But, uh, you know, uh, one thing that always I had a question for, right? When it comes down to taking care of uh, our brother that what you were just mentioning if, if you know we're supposed to sustain him if he falls on hard times is that not for the brothers in the faith more so than the people of the world because he also Undeniably. Said, uh, do not cast your pearls among swine right you, you know you're not supposed to aid a sinner in his in his folly correct undeniably so that's that's main more so uh, uh, for for the people in the faith. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, because, you know, like I was saying a while ago, you know, not all, you know, love thy neighbor as you love thyself. And like the most, uh, the most, uh, Yahweh Shai said, you know, when he was on the cross, you know, or, or I don't even know if it was on the cross, but he said, uh, the one who does the will of the father is my mother and my brother. You understand? Right. And, and so that, you know, we had to set what he said, uh, set a difference between the profane and the, the how did it go? The holy. And the holy, you know what I mean? And, and making a difference in between these things. It's a right, hard right. reality, right, that we have to look at people like that, you know what I'm saying? But that's what the, the Torah calls us to do. Undeniably. And it's delineation. And we got to be, and when I say judgmental, we have to be able to discern between, just like you said, the righteous and the wicked, the holy and the profane, right? The clean and the unclean. And that's where the Torah comes to give us righteous judgment. We don't judge according to sight, but according to righteousness. And righteousness we know is 
the commandments of the Most High. This is something that the Most High commanded us to do, and someone is not doing it. Well, the judgment is, I'm not fooling with you. Y'all rebuke you. That's a judgment. I didn't say y'all condemn you. Y'all rebuke. Y'all correct you. Right? Because there, there can be redeeming acts in that being done. But what you don't like me? Yeah, well, it's not personal. It's not that I don't like you. It's just I don't agree with that practice. I don't agree with that particular mindset. I don't agree with those words. Right? And that's just being straight up honest and straight up principled. But people in today's world are not really principled. And that's that's kind of like when Yahweh Shah said, you know, when you, if your brother asks you for bread, would you give him a stone, right? Or, or, or you know, in, in that instance, you know, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, not like we in here, you know, in Kansas City, we got a lot of people, for some strange reason, we got a whole lot of folks that done got homeless for some reason. And, and they come to the, the most poorest part of, of Kansas City to beg on the side of the road for money. And uh, just that be, is interesting. Yeah, isn't that strange? That, I never strange. thought about that. You do see them in the most dang yeah. <laughs> you the know, press part of the city asking for money. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, and I thought to myself that me and my friend was right, and I like I told her, I listen, you own the country. Right, your people run this entire thing. It, there's no reason for you to be sitting on the side of the road begging for money, right? But I, that's just. But the thing about it is, that I can see a man sitting on the side of the road drinking a beer, and he sits back and asks me for some money, right? And and our, you know, the father gives us discernment. He gives us wisdom, right? I'm not going to give you money when I know you what you're going to sit back and use the money for. You're sitting there drinking a beer. You're drunk right now. Right, right. <laughs> you know what all I'm kinds of oil. Yeah, you know what I mean. I'm getting drunk just smelling you. You know what I'm saying. And so, you know, in in those instances, even though they they are poor, right? But we're not supposed to aid or uh, or uh, aid people in that type of stuff. Am I exactly. correct? Right, 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 right. Very true. Very true. So as we wrap up Leviticus 25, is there anything in 26? Is there anything else that anyone has question-wise in regard to this Jubilee year and to the sabbatical observances that are all present from the weekly to the seventh year to the Jubilee Sabbath? Anything that stands out to anybody else? Because last week, remember, we covered the weekly Sabbath. We also covered the feast day Sabbath, so the appointed days, appointed times. Now we're covering the, the, the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. Any, any feedback, uh, insight, or questions before we move on to Jeremiah? All right, so moving on to Jeremiah, this is where it gets profound. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as related to his right over the earth. Because remember, well, let me ask you, what did Yah give Adam in relationship to the earth? What what did he authorize him to have? Dominion and power. Okay, dominion the over the earth. Somebody else was saying something? I'd say the commandments. Right, by keeping his commandments. So when he disobeyed and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what took place? He then had to till the earth. He had to work the earth to, to make it, to live. Not only that, something else took place. Did he have dominion anymore? No. So what happened? He lost, he fell from his position. So what could you consider that? Say that again. What can you consider that? A demotion. Not oh. only a demotion, a default, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. 
Mm. He defaulted on his contract. Mm. Mm. And as he defaulted on his contract, he lost right to that contract. Right? He was no longer the possessor of, as we're reading in Jeremiah chapter 32, the deed to the earth. He no longer had the title deed. Who got the title deed to the earth at that moment? Satan. Satan. <laughs> yep, the adversary then gained possession of the earth, which is why in Matthew and Luke 4, you see Yahushua get taken up to the highest mountain and told, behold, all the kingdoms of the earth in their glory. I will give them to you if you just bow down and worship me. Satan got the right to the earth when Adam defaulted, which is connected to Isaiah 14, when he says, let me establish my kingdom above the stars of the heaven. Let me set my throne above the stars of the heaven. And he was saying that he wants to rise above Israel, the people. So what has happened, there's been a transfer of, of, of <clears throat> I won't say ownership because y'all owns it, but management. There's been a transfer of management on the earth at that moment from Satan, from Yah, excuse me, from Adam to Satan. And the redemption has to take place. We have to purchase it back. But we have to take it back. And this is the struggle you see here with Esau and Yaakov. This is the struggle you see with Yitzhak and Ismael. This is the struggle you see all the way down to the present. And so with Jeremiah buying this field in Anathoth, this is just a, what could you call it? A case study. This is a case study on what we must do to redeem this land. This is the same thing that Abraham did when he first brought the cave of Machpelah. That was the first step in the process of him reclaiming the inheritance, of reclaiming the promise. This is about possession. That's what the word I was looking for. Not ownership, but possession. And all this is business ethics. These are all business principles. In fact, most of the parables that the Mashiach, the Messiah mentions are financial parables. Everything he's talking about, a lot of the things he's talking about are revolving around financial realities and financial stewardship. So there are lessons for us to learn from this on you know, how to conduct business. This is like the parable of the manager who got fired because of his misconduct. But what he does is he goes and he collects debts from his masters um, to pay off his debt. And Yahushua goes on and says that the sons of the age are more shrewd than the sons in the, of the kingdom on how to conduct their business. And it's true. And not to say that we should be so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. We have to understand that there are correlations between fulfilling the promise and prosperity. But our problem is this. This is something that hit me the other day. We look to do this individually. We don't understand the wisdom of collective work and responsibility. We don't stand the, the principles of cooperative economics. And I'm referring to the principles of Kwanzaa. I am, yes, because there's wisdom in that. Collective work and responsibility and cooperative economics are staples of Israelite economic 
science. But we try to do things on our own and get rich on our own. And I'm not saying this is a kingdom paradigm where there's, again, interdependency on one another. And we uplift each other. We bring support and, and we exchange services with one another first and foremost because that's where our wealth is going to come from. The way we become a lending nation is that as a nation, we've amassed the capital to lend. It didn't say individuals are going to be lenders. No, this is a national reality. And as a national reality, it would behoove us to, to think as a nation and to work together as a nation. Thoughts, reflections, insights, challenges, questions? I'm not right off. Good study. So with this case study with Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu and Baruch, his, his scribe, this is about reestablishing possession based on the laws of Jubilee and, and, and establishing the deed to the house or the deed to the land for ancestral purposes. The same thing that we have to do to get our land back. Now here's the question. What is the witness to this deed? What is it that would allow for us to have a claim on the deed to the promised land? What do we have as proof and evidence that we have a claim to the deed of that land? Our history. That's not, that's arguable. You can, we can, that, that's not definitive. It's, it's, it's arguable, but what is an undisputed claim that we can make? Circumcision of the heart? Very and much so. The Torah? And the, Our and obedience to Torah. Command, right, our command. And when we do that and we demonstrate Yah is with us, it shuts down everything. We have to present Yah's presence to this world, to claim the deed to that land. That's all that people are waiting on. Once we show the world Yah's with us, there's no more arguments that are gonna be made. There will be no need for an argument. That's like Elijah dealing with the 350 prophets of Baal. He prayed to Yah poof, Yah manifested, not poof, but Yah made itself manifest and the people were convinced. If every knee is going to bend and every tongue is going to confess that Yah is ill, well, that's going to be contingent on our demonstration that Yah exists and lives in us. There's no other way. There's no other way for anybody to claim that land rightfully except for Yah Shekinah to be manifested on them. There's no other way. That shuts everything down. And that's what this is pretty much saying here. After I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to Yah saying, ah, Master Yah, see, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm, there is no matter too hard for you who show kindness to thousands and repay the crookedness of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty El Yah Sevaot is his name, great in counsel and mighty in work for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of their deeds. 
For you have set signs in the land of Mitzrayim to this day and in Israel and among other men. And you have made yourself a name as it is this day. And you have brought your people Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great and fearsome deeds. And you gave them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and possessed it, but here's where we failed. But they did not obey your voice, nor did they walk in your Torah. They did not do all that you commanded them to do. So you brought all this evil upon them as a sign and as a witness to your sovereignty. This is where we flip the script. If we don't want to experience evil, if we don't want to experience this exile and this banishment and this uh, default, return to the covenant. So we can get rightfully turned back to where we're supposed to be. Thoughts, questions, comments, insights? All right, we're going to wrap up with Luke. Mashiach now, after his baptism and after his test, he's teaching. He's proclaiming, as we read from Isaiah 61, the acceptable year of Yah, the year of Jubilee. And not only is he proclaiming it, he's going about doing the work of Jubilee, healing the sick, right? Releasing the captives, those who are, who are bound to their sins, right? That's why he told the person who was crippled on the bed, you have been forgiven your sins. What's easier for me to say, rise up and take your bed, I forgive you your sins, because they were connected. They were connected. So the authority, the assurity that he walked in, that he was fulfilling his purpose and in his lane and on his mission was evident. Are we doing that? Is that something that we're mindfully walking in as we engage this world and engage our brothers are in the darkness? Are we knowing that we're the light and walking as the light for the sake of redemption and repairing the age? Because that's what this is about. Are we agents of change? Are we influencers? You hear that term so much today. You hear people that are influencers. What are they influencing people to do? Most of them are being stupid. Mm -hmm. To be foolish. Women mm -hmm. are around half clothed. Dress and these away. Mm -hmm. right. No clothing. Doing no. everything. Half surgeries. And materialists. <laughs> Plastic. Materialists. Plastic surgeries abounding. Mm-hmm. It's everything totally counter to Torah. Everything. Yeah. Kingdom dynamics to kingdom principles. Yeah, everything. And when you look at how, first, several things like instead of releasing people from debt, they charge interest and interest accelerates and they tax the poor. You, you get penalized for being poor. And. Yep, so and with the uh, with them talking about uh, Roe versus Wade um, and overturning that, the thing the thing about Roe versus Wade, at the same time they push for uh, women to have reproductive re reproductive rights or be able to make the choice as to whether or not they can kill their child or not, basically making sacrifices to Molech. Uh, and at the same time, we live in a sexualized country. Where everything yeah. is sex, 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 sex. You know, <clears throat> I was just at 
at a school at University Academy, and we let the kids go out for recess, fifth, I mean fifth grade. And some of the dances that they were doing, it was basically, I mean, it's like soft porn mm -hmm. in fifth grade with cell phones and everything. And so at the same time, we are, we're talking about population control, but then we're, we're making more and more sacrifices to uh, Malak and saying that, you know, we need to kill the babies because we don't have the formula. I mean, so it's, it's really, really crazy. And it's everything that's uh, counterproductive to Torah. Every, it goes total, totally against it. So that's also, that's why we have to come out of her. Right. Yep. 100%. And be a part of this redemption. And, and it's been said in this room today, you know, about casting your pearls before swine. We have to be very wise and discerning about who we shine the light to. Right. Because there are many who masquerade as, as angels of light, but inwardly they are you know, they're demons. And so we have to be very discerning of the spirits in which we are engaging and who we choose to share information with, right? Yes. And who we choose to align ourselves with and, and present the good news to. There is good news in these times despite the gloom and doom that is on the horizon. And that's something that we have to take hope and expectancy in and with. But you know, you know the other part with that is you have to be prepared. Uh, just like we as people have has to be prepared. The land also, everything has to be prepared in order for the seeds to be planted. And you know, our vessels uh, need to be prepared in order for the Holy Spirit to dwell within. Yep. Uh, the field, it has to be tilled, toiled in order for seeds to be planted. So there's a, always a preparing process or a uh, a tempering process involved in anything. Right. Yep. So real quick, looking at 31 and 32, Luke 4. He came down to Kafar Nahum. Anybody know what Kafar Nahum means? Anybody familiar with that? particular meaning. So this is the village of comfort. Okay. This is where they found comfort. This is where they found solace because why he was teaching them on Shabbat. He was giving them life <sighs> on the day that is set apart for us to receive an additional soul. And he was teaching them with authority. Right, because he was well aware, number one, of who he was and what his mission and his role was in the kingdom and what he was to do with it. And the beauty of the matter is we all can have this same access. We can all do what we are commissioned to do with authority when we find out what we're supposed to be doing. Now, you won't receive honor and accolades from this world because the world is going to be against you. Because you're bringing things that are contrary to what this world is established upon. But for those who are of the kingdom and not of this world, that's where you're going to find your reward. And not so much monetarily, but your reward are in the souls that you're reaping and harvesting and bringing back to Yah. That is what the true reward is. And there will be sustainability as well. But the focus is on the souls and bringing these souls back home, redeeming these souls from bondage. Because what people are not sold into enslavement physically nowadays. What are they sold to nowadays? What are they enslaved to nowadays more than anything? Well, it's fame, substances, um, lies, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. everything that's untrue. So, so, so encapsulate that all in one word. 
Materialist. Materialist. Yes, Nicola. <laughs> I'll give you another clue. Three letters. Sin. 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 Yeah. <laughs> sin. We are sold to sin. So the goal that we have is to redeem individuals from their bondage to sin. Oh, maybe I should. And that's the challenge. That's what we are called to do. And that's what Shaul tells us that we're to be about, I believe it's the sixth chapter. I'm going to go back to five, though. Yep. I'm going to start at verse 18 and go back down. Let's go back to 16. Do you not know? Keep in mind, it's just like when our ancestors found out that the Emancipation Proclamation was declared and enslavement was no longer lawful. Mm -hmm. Many of them who did not know how to make a living for themselves, what they do, Easter? Oh, a lot of them stayed on the plantation and worked as hey. sharecroppers. Yep, they went back into enslavement for the most part. They presented themselves back to their masters as their laborers. My family did that. Do you not know? that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience, you are servants of the one whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. It's the Elohim, sit up. But sit up, that don't mean lay down, sit up. But thanks to Elohim that you were servants of sin Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And having been set free from sin, you were redeemed, right? Through the blood of Mashiach, Yahushua. You became servants of righteousness. You turned yourself over to a new master. I speak as a man because of the weakness of your flesh. But even as you did present your members as servants of uncleanness and of lawlessness, resulting in lawlessness. So now present your members as servants of righteousness, resulting in set apartness, or what we know as holiness, kedusha. But when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You had no clue what righteousness was. You weren't able to do a lick of righteousness. You were free from that, but you were servants of sin. What fruit therefore were you having then over which now you are ashamed? For the end thereof is death. When we were serving sin, we were working death and didn't even know it. We were working for death. And we didn't even know it because it didn't happen right away. But now having been set free from sin and having become servants of Elohim, you have your fruit resulting in set apartness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death make no mistake that's the law but the favorable gift of elohim is everlasting life and messiah yahoshua our master hallelujah and that's why it goes on to tell us in seven and most importantly chapter eight there is now no sin offering to those who are in messiah yahoshua who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit, according to the word, the more you are in alignment and order with your steps in the word, the more guilt-free you are, the more clear your conscience is, the more naked and unashamed you are before the master. And these are simple principles. They're not easy to conduct ourselves with, but they're simple principles. But it's about 
being redeemed from this bondage. And all of us have our, our, our masters that we're, in, that we're in bondage to, even to this day. But the, the, the key is to find ways to allow for our kinsman redeemer, our Messiah, Yahushua, to set us free from that. And then to walk away from it, because we've already gotten the deed. We've already, he's, he's, he owns the deed to us now. Did you know that there were papers of ammunition that were exchanged when someone purchased their freedom? They got, the, let me see your papers. Let me see your papers. Let me see that deed. Who owns you? They had papers on our ancestors. And they got papers on us today. Guess what they call it today? Birth certificate, social security, social security number, security card, <laughs> driver's license. They yeah. still own us. Passport. All that. Them are receipts of purchase. Can we please drive? Here's my permission. Yes, you can drive. Can I be born? Can I be? Can I function? Here's your birth certificate. You're alive. I don't need that. In this, in this system, you do. If you're going to be of this system, yes, you do. You're born with a debt already on your head. But do you know you can you can purchase those documents yourself? You can exchange those documents and be the owner and the possessor of those documents yourself. Yes, sir. You can That's put those in a trust and copyright those. And now anybody who uses those against your will, they're infringing on your rights. Did you know, uh, yes, sir, I, I, there was a guy that did a, 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 a sir, I mean, a, a, what they call them, seminars. Mm -hmm. when, when you're born in a hospital and your parents are, you know, they have you to Informing sign. Informing on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when they have you to sign that uh, your birth certificate, that's actually a contract between your parents and the state. It yep. has absolutely nothing to do with you. Yep. As a being. That's a contract that your parents have in, uh, entered into, it, there's a, something called the, the Black Letter Law Book, if you ever yep. have a chance to look at that. And it is Black Law, Black Law Dictionary. Yeah, yeah the Black Law <laughs> fascinating to go in there and read about uh, uh, your birth certificate. That's actually a contract between your parents and the state that really you're not legally bound to uphold to. And it's a bond. Yeah, it's a bond, exactly. Yep, yep, that's exactly what it's it is. It's like worth millions. <laughs> And that's exactly it's worth millions of dollars. Yeah, it's commerce. Your commerce. Yep. Undeniable. Your currency. Yep. Hands it's down. The same, it's the same thing with a uh, wedding certificate, too. When you All sign that. a wedding certificate, you become married to the state as well. They have jurisdiction over your marriage. And, 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 and in, those, in those functions, the state has jurisdiction over everything. They are your guide, pretty much in civil affairs. I mean, you can circumvent it, but when you enter into contract, because you're entering into a contract with them upon that, that's the contract, that's the agreement, right? They call everything, America is built on social contracts. It is based on you giving consent with your signature. But if you know how to reserve your rights, Right, without prejudice, then you can still function as a free sovereign individual. That's a whole different story, though. The point that I'm making is this Joshua told Israel, Choose this day who you shall serve. Right? This is what this all comes down to. Because the bondage, it exists in so many forms and fashions. It exists civilly, it exists emotionally. It exists spiritually, it exists financially, right? It exists on so many fronts that we have to understand how to break free from all of these bondages that we've voluntarily walked into. Some ignorantly, we have with some in ignorance, but nonetheless, it's still a volunteer type of experience. And so getting back to Luke, you know, the father gives us institutions that we are to function according to.
He gives us his Sabbaths. He gives us his dietary laws. He gives us his business practices. He gives us all these different institutions and orders for us to, to carry out, one, to set us apart, two, to let him have authority and jurisdiction over us, and three, for us to go and redeem this age and bring order back into existence and bring light to this dark, dying world. And that's why the whole Book of Lamentations was written is because Israel refused. And Israel wanted to be like the Gentiles. How can leaders be leaders following followers? <laughs> You're following followers expecting to be the leader. And that's always been Israel's problem. It's idolatry. idolatry. Pretty much. Pretty much. And I had a thought the other day, you know, it even comes down to this. It even comes down to putting ourselves second. I had struggle in my life of serving myself more than I served Yah. Carrying out my will more than I've carried out my father and my king's will. And that's something that that's bondage too. And we have to like break free from that. We have to allow the blood to run and redeem us from that as well. And we have to stand in that authority and claim that authority and exercise it. Every time that we're confronted with it, not just when we want to, okay, I think I'm gonna resist. It's about resistance, period. Resist the devil and he shall flee. So here's my question. What or who is the devil? What or who Our is mind. the devil? It can be. Anything can that's be. not of Yah. There it is. Anything that is not of Yah's will is the devil. It's the, di it's the Diablo. It's the double. It's the illusion. Illusion is Yah, it's not Yah, excuse me, it is, it is of the devil. Illusion mm -hmm. is against Yah. When it's not Yah's will, that's when it's the devil. Is that clear? And if we're going to be citizens of this kingdom and this new world and this new heaven and this new earth it's all or none Yah's asking for all or none you shall love yah your elohim with all your heart all your soul and all your strength this is the challenge for us this is this is this is where yah's testing us to see if we love yah with all of our heart soul and strength when we get into those matters of trial that we talked about earlier, when we're down and out, you love Yah? Or are you going to compromise your principles and your love of Yah so that you can just get by that day? Are you going to withstand that trial? Are you going to overcome and endure to the end where the blessing lies? Because moments, moments will never add up to eternity. <laughs> Never. So on that note, let's close with Romans 8. This is so beautiful. Yeah, it's so good. It says this. Let's start with verse 14. Romans 8, 14. I'm going to go just to verse 18. For as many as are led by the spirit of Elohim, these are sons and daughters of Elohim. As many as are led by the word of Elohim. Let's really make this clear. These are the children of Elohim. 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children also heirs to the inheritance, to the promise, to the land and to the life, if children also heirs, truly heirs of Elohim and co-heirs with Messiah, who is our kinsman redeemer. Yahoshua is the next of kin that gives him the right of redemption to access us from sin and death, to redeem us from that. If children also heirs, truly heirs of Elohim and co-heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we also be exalted together. And here's the key verse. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the esteem that is to be revealed in us. Say love. That's a mouthful. Suffering is a part of the passion of life. But the question is, what will we suffer for? If you're going to suffer, what are you going to suffer for? Are you going to suffer for being messianic? Are you going to suffer for being a murderer, a thief, a, 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 a liar? What is it called? The, all those things that it mentioned in, in 1 Peter 4. For being wicked. That's not why we should suffer. Because everybody on this earth, in one way, shape, form, or fashion, is going to have some form of suffering that they're going to have to endure. But how are you going to suffer? Is the question. Any closing thoughts from anybody? All right close out in prayer and we will go from there so in the spirit of prayer hallelujah hallelujah we are not new Korim, who missed a coim, who modim, left name Melech, Melki Hamalakim, Hakados, Boruchu, Se Huno Teshamayan Vea Sororet, the Meshovia Kra Oba Shamayim, Ima all, the Shahinat Ozobo Gobohai Borumim, who Eloheinu Enod, a met Malkano FS Olato. To the Torah, to the Yarat Hayom, the Heshovata El of Avacha, Ki Yahuah, who Elohim, the Shamayim, Ima Ava, Aha, Aretz, Metacha, Enod, El Tenach Velacha, Yahu Eloheinu, Laraot, Maharabah, Teferet, Uzacha, the Haabir Golanin, Men Haaretz, the Halalim, Kerot, Nikratun. Any alarm by Melkut should die, but called the Nibasa Yikra Uba Shemecha. They have for not Eliki Koreshiaret, Yiruva Yode U, Koyesbe, Taba, Kilacha, Tikara, Koberek, Tishaba, Kolashon, Feneka Yahua Elohenu, Yakara Uba Yifalu, the Chabot Shimka, Yakar Yatanu, the Yikabalu Holam, Ed Al Mahutek, Abatimlok, and the Hem Maharale Alam Vayet. Ki ha melchut shel ha hi, u lem le mi et log bakabod, kakatu batora teka. Ya yem log le olam vayet, re ne mar vahaya yahua le meleka koha are. Bayom ha hu, bayom ha hu, ye hi ye yahua echa, lushamo echa. We rise to our duty to praise the master of all, to acclaim the creator, elevate our lot unlike that of other people, assigning to us a unique destiny. We bend the knee and bow, acknowledging the supreme sovereign, the holy one, exalted, who spread out the, heaven the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. 
whose glorious abode is in the highest heavens, whose mighty dominion is in the loftiest heights. This is our El, there is no other. In truth, El alone is our ruler, as it is written in the Torah. Know this day and take it to the heart that Adonai is El in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. And so we hope in you, Adonai, our El, soon to see your splendor, that you will sweep idolatry away so that false gods will be utterly destroyed and that you will perfect the world by your sovereignty so all humanity will invoke your name and all the earth's wicked will return to you repentant. Then all who live will know that to you, every knee must bend, every tongue pledge loyalty to you, Adonai. May all bow and worship. May they give honor to your glory. May everyone accept your dominion, reign over all soon and forever and all time. Sovereignty is yours and glory now and forever. Thus it is written in your Torah, Adonai reigns forever and ever. Such is written in the prophetic assurance Adonai shall be acknowledged the ruler of all the earth. On that day shall Adonai be one in his name. Amen. <laughs> Yehesh me rabba me vorak, le olamu me amaya, yid barak, yid barak, va yishtabach, va yipa, va yiroman, va yidnase, yihadar, va yidale, va yidalam, shemay de kudusha, berichu, elam in kol barakata, va shirata, tushbekata, va nekmata, damiran, va ma vimiru amen, yehesh lama rabba me shamaya, va chaim alenu, vi al kol israel, vimiru amen. Ose shalom bim romav, hu yaten shalom aleinu, v'yom kol Israel v'imiru, amen. Yevarechecha yahuwa v'yishmarecha, ya'er yahuwa panava lecha v'yihunecha, yisha yahuwa panava lecha v'yisim lecha, shalom. May Yah bless you and keep you, may Yah cause his countenance to shine upon you, be kind to you, may Yah lift up his face unto you, and give you peace in Messiah, Yahushua's name we pray, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. All right. Um, Coach Shakita, we want to say Shabbat Shalom, more like Shavuot Tov, and welcome you to Beit Mashiach. Uh, Coach Wendy as well, and Coach Levita, welcome again. Um, pray you all had a um, insightful time here, yes. an engaging time. For all praises to Yah. Uh, please feel free to come back. We do have prayer. On Wednesday nights, we actually go over what's called the um, Arvit Lachon, which is the evening offering. Um, wanting to do afternoon prayers around one o'clock on Sunday. Uh, we can go over the Mincha prayer on Sundays at one o'clock and eventually maybe wake up a nice five o'clock in the morning on one day or 530 and do the Shacharit prayer which is about a good 45 minute session one day of the week. We can figure that out sometime soon. So y'all use the night. same it's, Zoom? Um, no, oh. I don't think everybody's in the same Zoom. Well, no, 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 I mean same Zoom number. Oh yes, yeah, this is the same Zoom here. This okay. Is, this is pretty much for Bait Mashiach uh, across the board, so yes. Okay. Um, I thought I thought that was the same time zone. But this no, is the no. um. So not this Sunday, but next Sunday, we may start, we will start about one o'clock for, uh, this is central time, for the um, afternoon prayer, Mincha. It's called Mincha. And it is a liturgical prayer that our ancestors came up with. Um, and so we'll use that. And then we'll figure out sometime one day out of the week to institute the morning prayer. So we'll have afternoon prayer on Sundays, evening prayer on Wednesdays, and then we'll find a morning on which to do the uh, morning prayer. Okay. We'll find some time to do that. Excuse Other me. than that, always a pleasure to see you all virtually. Excuse me, sir. I got Hear one. Hear you all's voices. Uh, thank you for your feedback, your responses, your insights, even your questions and your, Hello. your challenges. So it helps us all to grow. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. I just wanted to tell Elder Sharon that thank you, and I have been working on not calling my brother's dogs, and it's been working. 
And so I just wanted to let her know that I, I took <laughs> what she said to heart and I, I have gotten that idle word out of my vocabulary. Well, that's a 